I think everyone interested in physics is familiar with the formula E equals mc squared, has heard that it was derived by Einstein in his theory of relativity, and understands it as describing the equivalence of the concepts of mass and energy. That is, an object with mass always possesses energy, and an object with energy always possesses mass. However, if you, dear viewer, also thought so, I must disappoint you. In reality, you've been mistaken all this time. Let's start with the fact that this formula was not actually created by Einstein, but by Henri Poincaré, and this happened five years before the theory of relativity, back in 1900. But that's only part of the problem. The bigger issue is that the physical meaning of this formula is often misunderstood, or rather, not entirely correctly understood. While it is true that any object with mass possesses energy, not every object with energy possesses mass. To be precise, in some cases, objects with energy do behave as though they have mass, but this isn't always the case. Carelessly applying the formula E equals mc squared to convert energy into mass can lead to completely incorrect conclusions. We've touched on the topics of mass, energy, and relativity indirectly in several of our previous videos. However, Judging by the comments, and especially the questions from subscribers in private messages, I realized that a separate video dedicated to this topic is necessary. So in this video, we will figure out what the formula E equals mc squared actually means, how to correctly understand and use it, and most importantly, in what cases mass and energy are equivalent concepts, and in which they aren't, and why. In everyday life, we often use mass as a measure of the amount of substance. However, if we try to apply this approach in science, physicists, and especially chemists, will promptly correct us. They have a separate unit for measuring the amount of substance, which is measured in moles and defined as the number of structural units, e.g. atoms or molecules, in a specific portion of that substance. That said, each molecule has a mass, which, in the case of a pure substance, is identical. Additionally, in classical physics, mass is an additive quantity meaning that the mass of a system consisting of several objects equals the sum of the masses of those objects. Specifically, the mass of a given quantity of substance can be determined using the formula where nu is the amount of substance and m capital is its molar mass, a characteristic of the given substance. Therefore, in classical physics, there is indeed a direct and unambiguous relationship between mass and the amount of substance. Since mass is technically easier to measure than counting molecules, using mass as a characteristic of the amount of substance has become a widespread practice. But what exactly is mass from the perspective of physics? In school-level physics, this fundamental concept is given two essentially unrelated definitions. First, we're told that mass is a measure of an object's inertia. That is, a measure of how much force is required to change the object's velocity more precisely, its momentum, by a certain amount. It is in this sense that mass appears in Newton's second law, as well as in classical formulas for kinetic energy and momentum. Secondly, we are also told that mass is a measure of the gravitational interaction between bodies. In this sense, it appears in, for example, Newton's law of universal gravitation, where the gravitational force between two bodies is proportional to the product of their masses. Thus, we essentially have two different types of mass, inertial and gravitational. For reasons that remained a mystery for a long time, these two masses are always equal to each other. However, in the theory of relativity, we encounter the fact that neither the concept of gravitational mass nor that of inertial mass is applicable, at least not in the way we are accustomed to applying them in classical mechanics. Let me explain what I mean. In classical mechanics, I remind you, we used to write the following formula for an object's momentum. However, in reality, this familiar school formula is incorrect, or rather, it works only for low velocities. In the general case of arbitrary velocities, including very high ones, we need to use the following formula, in which momentum depends on velocity in a somewhat more complex way. At low speeds, the ratio V divided by C, and especially the square of this ratio, is a very small number, which can be considered equal to zero, and we obtain the familiar school formula. However, the relativistic formula is the correct and precise one, 
which, by the way, has been confirmed by experiments in particle accelerators, where we actually accelerate these particles to speeds very close to the speed of light. To avoid carrying all these fractions and roots, in relativistic mechanics, such abbreviations are often used. The ratio of an object's speed to the speed of light is denoted as beta. The quantity obtained by dividing one by the square root of one minus beta squared is commonly denoted as gamma. One could say that beta indicates the extent to which relativistic effects should be considered for a given object, and gamma allows us to estimate the magnitude of these effects. Now let's see what happens to classical physics expressions, such as Newton's second law, as a result. In school, we write it like this, but even in university-level classical mechanics courses, it is more often written in this way, through the time derivative of momentum. It is not difficult to see that in classical mechanics, these are the same. Substitute the classical expression for momentum into the formula, treat mass as a scalar constant, factor it out of the derivative, and then recall that the time derivative of velocity is nothing other than acceleration, and we obtain the familiar form of Newton's second law. In reality, defining Newton's second law through momentum is a more accurate definition. Establishing a connection between Newton's second law and the law of conservation of momentum, which in turn is defined by a fundamental property of our universe, the homogeneity of its space. A similar formulation of Newton's second law is valid for relativistic mechanics, where the law of conservation of momentum also applies. However, in this case, we need to use the relativistic expression for momentum in the formula. And to write Newton's second law explicitly, we need to take the derivative of this expression with respect to time according to all the rules. That is, first write it in this form, and then after a series of transformations like this. What we have obtained is essentially Newton's second law in its relativistic form. Again, it is not difficult to see that at low speeds, when the magnitude of beta is approximately zero and gamma is approximately one, it reduces to the classical form of Newton's second law. However, at high speeds, the relationship between force, mass, and acceleration takes on an unfamiliar form. In this formula, the direct cause and effect relationship between force, mass, and acceleration that we are accustomed to is absent. Inertia, that is, how much an object resists attempts by a force to accelerate it, turns out to depend not only on mass, but also on speed, and most interestingly, on the angle between the velocity and the direction of the applied force. In other words, it turns out that at high speeds, the mass of moving bodies is no longer a measure of their inertia. That is, the proportionality coefficient between force and acceleration, in the sense that objects with the same mass, moving in different ways, can exhibit different inertia. And conversely, it is possible to choose movement parameters for objects of different masses in which they will have the same inertia that is, change their speed equally under the action of an applied force. The same applies to gravitational interaction. The force with which a small body interacts with a large one is written in relativity like this. And even if we substitute energy in the form of E equals mc squared here, which generally speaking should not be done for reasons we will describe below, we will see that even here, mass can no longer fully characterize the gravitational interaction of bodies at different distances from each other. Because this interaction is also determined by velocity and how this velocity is directed relative to the vector r connecting the centers of mass of the interacting bodies. But if none of the classical definitions of mass are applicable in relativistic mechanics, then what is mass from the perspective of the theory of relativity? In relativity, mass is understood as a quantity that links the energy and momentum of a particle according to a formula like this. In fact, E equals mc squared is merely a special case of this formula for the situation when the system's momentum is zero. This gives us the statement that any body possesses energy if it has mass. As for the classical definitions of mass as a measure of a body's inertia or its gravitational interaction, which we learned in school, they follow from this definition of mass in the limit of low speeds, that is, small values of kinetic energy and momentum. That is why they are equal to each other, and not just equal, but represent the same quantity, simply viewed from different perspectives. And from this, it becomes clear that a body possessing energy also possesses mass, 
equal to its energy divided by the square of the speed of light in only one specific case, when the body's momentum is zero, that is, for a stationary body. In all other cases, applying the formula E equals mc squared is simply mathematically incorrect. Let's test this formula using the popular claim that a photon has no rest mass, but possesses an energy mass, equal to its energy divided by the square of the speed of light. The energy and momentum of a photon are defined by these formulas. Substituting them into our equation gives us zero. Thus, in the theory of relativity, the mass of a photon is zero. And there is no such thing as an energy mass for a photon equal to its energy divided by the square of the speed of light. Now, let's analyze the same situation for a massive body with a rest mass m0. Will it possess some additional mass if we give it kinetic energy? For a body moving at a velocity v, the sum of its kinetic energy and rest energy is given by this value, while its relativistic momentum is given by this expression. Substituting into the formula, we factor out the rest mass from the brackets and under the square root. Through a series of straightforward transformations, we find that the value under the square root equals one. This means that the body's mass is always equal to its rest mass. In other words, there is no other mass besides rest mass. That is, the mass when momentum is zero, so there's no need to unnecessarily multiply entities. Mass is mass, singular and unique and its product with the square of the speed of light equals the rest energy, that is, the energy of a body of a given mass when its momentum is zero. Where then did the term relativistic mass come from? A term that has migrated from textbook to textbook for decades. Even though specialists who actively use the formulas of the theory of relativity in practice do not use it. This concept arose from an attempt by some physicists to interpret the formulas of the theory of relativity for energy and momentum. Indeed, there is a tempting notion to say that this quantity, equal to the product of mass and the relativistic factor gamma, which depends on velocity, is relativistic mass, and that even in the relativistic case of high velocities, momentum, for instance, can be calculated using the old school formula as the product of mass and velocity, provided we substitute relativistic mass into these formulas instead of regular mass. In physics, we can introduce any terms, create any notations, and write whatever subscripts we like on letters. No one forbids us from doing so. The problem is that introducing relativistic mass fundamentally does not make our lives any easier. If such a substitution allowed us to restore, for example, the classical form of Newton's second law, then yes, it would be justified. But unfortunately, it's easy to see that this does not happen. The concept of relativistic mass proves to be completely unproductive and even conflicts with the definition of mass in the theory of relativity itself. For this reason, I repeat, it is no longer used in practice, although it still occasionally appears in textbooks and lectures, thankfully, less and less frequently. Is rest energy, that is, the energy of a body when its momentum is zero, always equal to the product of its mass and the square of the speed of light? Not always. For instance, objects with internal structure may also have internal energy due to the motion and interaction of their constituent elements. Consider a volume of gas composed of molecules enclosed in a container whose mass we will disregard for now. The rest energy of this gas equals the sum of the rest energies of its constituent molecules, and the total momentum equals the sum of the momenta of these molecules. If the container with gas is stationary as a whole, that is, the velocity of its center of mass is zero, then the sum of the momenta of the molecules will also be zero. Thus, we can apply the formula E equals mc squared to relate the mass of the gas to its energy. However, the point is that the rest energy of this gas consists not only of the sum of the rest energies of its molecules, that is, the sum of their masses multiplied by the square of the speed of light. These molecules also have their own kinetic energy, and we even know how to calculate it. For a single molecule, assuming it can be treated as a material point, it is on average equal to three seconds of K multiplied by T, where K is Boltzmann's constant and T is the gas temperature. This means that the energy of a stationary gas composed of many molecules will be the sum of the rest energies of the gas's molecules. But we also need to add the total kinetic energy of the molecules. 
This entire expression should then be divided by the square of the speed of light to obtain the gas's mass. We are justified in doing this because the center of mass of the system is stationary, meaning the total momentum of its constituent particles, the molecules, is zero. The mass of the gas will be slightly greater than the sum of the masses of its molecules. The most intriguing part is that the same gas will have a slightly higher mass if its temperature is a bit higher, and a slightly lower mass if its temperature is a bit lower. Of course, this increase is not very large. The rest energy of a nitrogen molecule, which makes up most of the air we breathe, is approximately 10 to the power of minus 10 joules, while its kinetic energy at room temperature is about 10 to the power of minus 21 joules. This means that the mass of air under normal conditions is only about 1 100 billionth greater than the sum of the masses of its molecules. Nonetheless, it is essential to understand that mass in relativistic mechanics is no longer an additive quantity. That is, the mass of a system consisting of multiple bodies is generally not equal to the sum of the masses of these bodies. In cases where the total momentum of these bodies is zero, we can use the familiar formula E equals mc squared to calculate this mass. Interestingly, if we look at our formula for the mass of a composite body, we find that it can have mass even if the particles composing it are massless. For instance, imagine a vessel not filled with a gas of molecules, but rather a gas of massless photons endlessly bouncing off the perfectly reflective walls of the vessel. Photons have no mass, but do have kinetic energy. As a result, while the first term in our energy expression becomes zero, the second term will still be non-zero. The same principle applies to other massless particles, such as gluons, the counterparts of photons in the so-called strong nuclear interaction. Gluons have a unique property. They interact with one another and can, at least theoretically, form bound states called glue balls. These glue balls, composed of massless particles, must have mass according to the mechanism we discussed earlier. We covered glue balls in more detail in one of our previous videos. A link should now appear on your screen. For interacting particles, the situation becomes even more complex and fascinating, as the energy of such a particle ensemble will not only consist of the sum of their rest and kinetic energies, we must also account for the interaction energy between them. Accounting for this energy is a captivating and intricate process, leading to remarkable phenomena underpinning the entire physics of atomic nuclei and consequently all atomic and thermonuclear energy. However, this topic warrants a separate discussion, and we will undoubtedly explore it in one of our future videos. If you enjoy the content on our channel, I would be delighted if you consider becoming a sponsor, either here on YouTube or via our pages on Patreon or Boosty. A link to the latter should now appear in the upper right corner of your screen. A heartfelt thanks to everyone who already supports our project and to those who decide to join our sponsors today. That's all for now. Take care, dear friends, and see you soon in our upcoming videos.